Yeah, th uh, thanks, Victoria. Uh, yeah, so um, this is this is really going to be a sort of introduction to automatic differentiation. Um, but uh, yeah, first, just a couple of words about me. So my name's Oliver Strickson. Um, I work at a place called the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's national um, centre for data science and AI. Um, and we're based in the British Library, so there's the yeah. British Library looking looking nice. And um, there I work on a team uh, of uh, software engineers and data scientists. Um, and so in the sort of data science and machine learning, you often find that you um, express your problems as sort of a, an optimization. So optimization is quite an important tool in, in data science and machine learning. Um, so there's, there's a function with a sort of minimum, and we want to, we want to find it. And many optimization algorithms sort of use this idea of following, following a gradient down, downhill until, until you reach the optimum. Um, so, well, that's, that's fine. Uh, so I've got my sort of um, optimization routine minimized there, and so I pass it this, this function that I, want to, that I want to optimize, which could be, you know, for example, it could be a, um, some sort of uh, machine learning model that I want to train. Um, but I also need to pass it the, the, uh, the gradient, the derivative of that, of that function. Um, so also, that that's, should be no problem. I just write down what my, what my function is, and then I kind of think for a little bit, and I use the rules that I learned in school and, uh, and work out what the derivative is, and um, well, then, then I just pass that. Um, but what if my function is a bit more complicated? What if you know, I, my function is actually computed by a, by a neural network? Or indeed, what if it's computed by some arbitrary piece of, of computer code? Uh, that sounds that sounds quite quite hard to do, and in fact, it might have sort of branches and loops and things like that in it, which I'm you know wouldn't, wouldn't really be sure how to differentiate. Um, so as a as a kind of fallback, you might think, oh well, let's let's use um, let's differentiate it numerically. Let's take a sort of finite difference. Look look um, look at the function at, at, a, at a point and and sort of nearby and numerically compute the compute the slope. Um, and you, you can do that, although if you're, if you're having to resort to that, often it's better to rethink and actually maybe choose an algorithm that doesn't depend on the gradient. There's, there's um, optimization algorithms that, that it kind of don't depend on, on taking a derivative. Um, so, uh, well, an, an, another thing you might, you might consider doing is, is using some sort of computer algebra software and uh, input your function into that and then differentiate it. But um, one, one problem that the, this that sort of typically arises that way is the expressions become a little bit unwieldy. Also, you still have the problem of um, um, control flow constructs that you know maybe they're particular control flow constructs in your own language and how to how to sort of represent that. Um, so this this talk's actually going to be about a, a third option um, called automatic differentiation, and uh, so so. I'm, I'm going to introduce that, that algorithm and then show a, a little toy implementation in, in, written in Racket. So we just kind of sort of walk through, walk through that code. Um, as for kind of other, other implementations, sort of real implementations, there's, there's actually a lot out there. So I know of many in, in sort of many different languages. You know, I, know, I know at least of F Sharp and Haskell. There's a couple in Scheme. I think any probabilistic programming language will have, have something built in um, to, to sort of sol solve this problem. Um, uh, Julia has a particularly nice sort of auto diff story. Um, so, so actually, really, this is the, the, the flavour of this talk is like, let's have a go at implementing something that's quickly becoming a core core bit of of um, programming language infrastructure. Or, um, yeah, that you probably won't have to implement yourself, but in, at least in the sort of ML and probabilistic programming world, it's it's kind of quickly becoming quite important. Um, so just by way of by way of a sort of overview of the talk, so I'm just going to I, um, just in case you're not familiar with Racket, I'm just going to introduce a couple of bits of, of syntax, like scheme syntax, it, on a, on a couple of slides. Uh, then I'm just going to recap differentiation. I mean that's what that's what it's all about after all. Um, then I'll um, just quickly go through the actual, you know, what automatic differentiation algorithm is. And then finally, we'll we'll look at the implementation. Um, so so this is the first bit of, of, sort of scheme syntax. You can you can make things called pairs. 
Um, this is a sort of quite fundamental data structure, and you make that with the function cons. So there I've got two symbols, A and B, and I, I stick them together in a pair, and it looks like that with the, with the dot. Um, I can chain consists together, and that's how I make lists. Um, if I finish off with that special symbol null, then I get a sort of a, a proper list, um, and I can just kind of keep going. Um, and there's a helper function list, so I don't have to keep, keep writing cons all the time. Um, and of course, you can make kind of arbitrary structures like, like that, um, sort of tree structures. Um, you can extract the first and, and second element of a, of a pair with, with car and coulda, those are the sort of traditional names. And on, when applied to a list, it, it does that. Um, defining functions, there's this define followed by the formula of the function to take. You can define current functions like that. And using the same idea of this dot, um, x is there, gets bound to the list of the arguments. So I can, I can pass sort of an arbitrary number of arguments. And I, I get it in the function as a, as a list. Um, so quick, quick uh, like, what is, what is differentiation all about? So the derivative of a function is really the best linear approximation to, to that function at a point. It might not exist. Um, but if it, if it does, that's what it is. Um, I'll write in sort of mathy notation uh, functions like that, and in code, uh, it looks very similar. Um, I, I like this sort of operator notation for derivatives with the sort of capital DF, and in code, I'll write, I'll write that. Um, so, what I mean, best linear approximation. Okay, so I've got a function, uh, and I want to find some, I want to find some coefficient on my, on my, on my sort of uh, linear, linear approximation of it, and um, by, by which I mean sort of uh, anything, any, any sort of remainder terms de decay more quickly than, than linearly. And, and that just is, that coefficient just is the derivative. Um, if I've got, if I've got a multi sort of multidimensional function or fun function of more than one input, um, I get a very similar looking expression, and these are now the partial derivatives. And in the code, I'll write partial i. Um, and you can sort of put these things together into a single object, and there's obviously a lot of work on, um, on sort of making sense of what, of what that means. It's just like a single, single entity as a derivative. And, and it, actually, well, yeah, um, I think this book does a really nice job of kind of explaining how to do that in a way that's, that's suitably, suitably general for um, the kind of structures that you find in programs. Uh, so this uh, structure and interpretation of classical mechanics, it's a really great book, but it has a nice little appendix where, it, where they do sort of differentiation. I recommend that if you haven't, if you haven't come across it. Um, so what, what kind of lets us tackle this problem at all? Like why, can we, why do we even think we can differentiate any, any function? Well, um, we've got this composition property. So if, I, if I've got a function and it's a composition of two others, um, I can, um, yeah, the, fun the function is a composition, and then I can, I can work out what the, the derivative of that composition is. And it's just simply the product of the derivative. So that's normally called the chain rule. Um, and for, um, for functions of multiple variables, it looks, looks like that. I sort of add the, add the partial derivatives. Um, so that lets us really, really differentiate anything. If I give you um, some kind of functions that I start off with, you know, I, I, I call them my sort of primitive operations, things like plus and times and cosine and exponentials and things. I give you sort of this handful of, of functions and I tell you how to differentiate them. I can really now differentiate anything because I just apply that rule repeatedly. Um, so in principle, we're kind of done, right? I don't, don't need any more than that. Um, however, it, it really helps to, to approach this quite systematically and this, this, the algorithm we'll see is just sort of a systematic way of, of basically applying the chain rule. Um, so here's an, here's an arithmetic expression, um, and it will be helpful to, to write it in these sort of two alternative ways, um, either as a graph, uh, so I sort of propagate, propagate my inputs through the graph, and I've given sort of temporary names to the, to the um, outputs of the intermediate functions, or in this kind of SSA rem reminiscent way. Um, and probably the, they're all kind of useful. I mean, you probably want to write the thing on the top. The, the thing on the left, the sort of graph, is, is useful for, for thinking about it. And the thing on the right is actually what we, we want to work with in the program. Um, 
So let's let's compute um, uh, derivative of, of f at, at a and b given that example, which is you know um, a times a plus a times b. Um, and this this okay. So this is this is the automatic differentiation algorithm applied to this this particular example. Um, so we, we first of all introduce a couple of sort of temporary variables. I've, I've given these them these sort of funny names. Um, they may be sort of reminiscent, or they may sort of evoke um, some some idea of differentiation. But I, I'm not really going to define that as, as particular notation. I'm just introducing them as as kind of names. Um, and then I look at kind of my first operation, which is that is the sort of a a times a is c, um, and I, I kind of write down write down that as a I kind of write down the linearized version of that term and um, pass these variables through. So that gives that gives me this new this new variable, and I do that repeatedly. So I do that for each term in the in the graph, and what I claim is when I when I finish that process. I've, I've got the, the, the derivative of f, or in particular the, the sort of zeroth partial derivative of f. Okay, that's that's one way to do it. I, I, I mean, I hope that's not surprising. That's just that's just using sort of rules of differentiation. Um, there's another way to do it. Oh, okay. Well, what I was what I was actually going to say was so the the reason it gives you the first partial derivative is because you started off with a one and a naught. If you start off with a naught and a one, you get the first partial derivative. Um, and in fact, you can get any directional derivative that way. Um, and that's called forward mode differentiation. I start at the at the top of the graph, and I just propagate these things through um, in the same direction as as my computation took. Um, so that's that's forward mode. Um, and I'll write in the code little dx instead of this dx by dr, and sometimes call them the perturbation variables. Um, and so that the algorithm in general, what what it's doing is when I when I sort of see when I walk through this graph. I see an operation, a sort of primitive operation op, um, with these inputs x, y, and output z. Um, I'm, I'm sort of modifying the graph, and I replace replace that with um, a linear a linear version of that computation, which is on on the perturbation variable. So I introduce these dx, dy. I then scale them by an, by an appropriate amount and add them, and the amount I scale them by, of course, is is given by the partial derivative. So then I end up with with that slightly more complicating looking looking graph. Um, so I, walk, I basically walk my graph um, from from one end to the other, and I, I replace each operation with 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 that, um, and then that's that's it. That's the graph representing the the derivative. Um, of course, if I if I know how to differentiate d zero up and d one up, then I can differentiate this in turn. Um, another thing that's sort of important to point out is the graph of the derivative depended on the original inputs x and y. So I have to I have to have run the original calculation first, or, or alongside it at least. Um, there's, there's another way to do it, um, and in, in a way, this this way is, is a little closer to what you might do if you had an expression differentiate pen and paper. Um, and this is you introduce another another temporary variable called dis, ds by de, and what we're going to do is we're going to start at e and and sort of walk backwards along the graph, so we follow edges the wrong way. Um, so we start with ds by de is one, and then we just simply again apply these apply these rules at e, locally at each operation um, until we get to um, ds by db and ds by da, and now I claim that the the derivative is actually I've given by the the pair of these things. Um, so first of all, interesting to note that I've now done it in one sweep. So before I had to. I had to do two sweeps. I had to do um, the one for the for each partial derivative. Um, now I've done. Now I've run the algorithm once, and I've I've got the the gradient in sort of one go. Um, obviously, if I had two outputs, I'd have to do two sweeps. Um, but what's what's kind of interesting is many of these problems have are quite. They, they have they take many inputs. I've got I've got some some neural network with many weights, and I I want to compute its gradient, which is. Um, and, and the output's a single number, so I've got I've got this sort of um, function of many inputs to a single output, and that's called reverse mode. Um, and I'll write in the code I'll write a of x instead of um, instead of 
ds by dx, and they're called the sensitivity variables or the adjoints. Um, and and as, a, as a graph modification, it, it looks a little like this. So now I, I uh, do, do what we did in the example, which is reverse the edges, um, introduce these ax variables, um, and, and replace the operation with a sort of linearized version again. And the, the dot, dot, dots mean, well, I've, I've, I might have multiple things. You know, AX might have a fan out, so I might actually have multiple, um, um, multiple edges sort of converging on A, on AX. So I have to sort of, that, that's one thing that makes the implementation a little tricky. Um, and in general, it looks like that. Um, okay, so that, that lets us now really differentiate any expression. So we can use these two, two algorithms, these two graph algorithms. Um, anything involving these primitive operations. Um, so obviously, like, real code can be a lot more complicated than that. You know, I might have branches and loops and things in it. Um, so the, this, the central idea is really that I'm going to, I'm going to um, differentiate the result of the, the call graph that I get when I run the program. So I get a... I get a um, every value in the program was determined by some sequence of operations, and I just differentiate that sequence. Um, now, how, how might I go about that? Well, you could just do it at runtime. You could just find out what that sequence of operations is, um, det as determined by the, by the invocation of that function. Um, or you might try and do something a little more clever and, and manipulate these things in advance. Um, if, you, if you do um, manipulation of the, of the code statically, you then have to figure out a way of sticking it all together such that I get the correct, the correct graph. Um, or, there's, uh, or as an alternative, you can do local transformations on the program. If you've come across dual numbers b before, that's, that's that. But it also turns out you can do reverse mode um, um, with a local transformation involving continuations. Um, the, the way I'll do the implementation is just, just at runtime. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to get, get a trace and differentiate that. Um, and we want, that, we want that trace to sort of be flat in, in that form that I had, I had before, just a sequence of operations. Um, so let's, let's get the trace then. So, you know, let, there's, a, there's a function, some squares, which sort of does, does what it says it, says it does. Um, and, and what we now want to do is, is, is instead of invoking that function normally, we want to say x and, x and y have a little bit of sort of history along, along with them. Uh, so... Along, along with the, result, the sort of value three, it's got how, how did I get there? How did I compute that three? And when I compute sum of squares, I, I take, these, take these traces of the arguments and I sort of stick them together and I get the result 25 and, and along, along with all the intermediate variables that I had to sort of calculate to, to, to get the result. Um, and sort of, I'm, I'm going to represent them a little like that. Like there, there was just a X and Y were just constants and I kind of stick them all together in that, in that trace. Um, so in, in Racket, we like making little languages. So let's make a little language that does it. Um, OK, now I'm going to try and. So this is, this is just, does that actually work? Oh, yeah. Is that big enough? OK, so this, is, this, is just, this is just sort of normal Racket. And you'll see it starts with that hash lang Racket line. Um, I, can, I can put other things there as well. So I mean, Racket has a. Racket, there's a little type language. I think there's a lazy language. In fact, there's, there's hundreds of them. Um, and, and the language we, 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 we're going to implement is, I, I call it rack, rack propagator. Um, and we're going to use this rack propagator trace language. Um, so let's write our, let's write our um, sum of squares function. Oh, sorry. Slipped into, into common list mode there. Squares. Um, okay, so we run, and then some squares, three, four, and we get 25. Now, where's the trace? Well, let's have a look. Trace, display, sum, squares, three, four. So we can see with that, with that sort of help of that function, we can see how, how, the, uh, how the 25 was computed. Um, and, and of course, if I do display three, I've got constants and function application in there. Is that right? 
Well, that's, that's what we want our little language to do. We just want it to sort of trace, trace everything. Um, so we'll represent an assignment in that language, like one of, one of these terms in the trace, just as a struct um, containing the identifier, the expression I computed it with, and, and a value. Um, and we'll put a contract on it, just so I, I really ensure that my identifiers are always symbols. I, I, I always end up with an expression, and we'll define an expression like that. Uh, that is to say, either a constant or a function application, and value can be anything. And uh, we'll just make this slightly opaque structure called, called trace that contains, contains the assignments, and I'll give it um, uh, some, some helper functions, trace add, which takes an assignment, sticks it on the trace. I can append multiple traces, and I can extract the trace of an identifier. Uh, and I called the... I called the most recent assignment, that is the sort of result of an assignment, uh, the top. Um, you can tell it's called top because when I print it out, it's at the, at the bottom. That's probably not a good choice of name. Um, and I, I also can extract the value, the identifier, and the expression uh, from, from the top of a trace just with these, these other helper functions. Uh, so what does, what does addition look like? Well. I write, um, I, I want to write this add function that, that adds two traces. So it takes traces and I append the traces together. I then make, a, make an assignment that represents their value. And to do that, I have to make an expression containing plus and the identifiers. Um, I make a value, which is the sum of their, the tops of their value. Um, so that's, that's addition. And then I do the same for multiplication, except multiplies everywhere. Exponentiation has um, just one argument, but as otherwise a similar, it's very similar. And to be honest, that, that gets old quite quite quickly. Writing writing all that. Um, so let's let's write down um, the the general general form of, of the things we were of the functions we were just writing. Um, so they all have they all look a bit like this, right? They have a, a function f, some arguments, and um, then I just combine the traces in in that, in that particular way. Um, and it turns out that's, that's valid racket syntax. So I just, I just um, introduced this new syntax rule or macro um, called define trace primitive, and that lets me quickly define, define new primitives. So that's, that's that. And I can, I can use that, that macro to just quickly define many things. Um, so we've got, um, we've got these... Uh, um, these functions, they've, they've all got slightly funny names, plus and, times and, and so on. So they're, they're the functions as they are in our module where we implemented them. In, in my language, I want those to be the real thing. So I want them to be addition, multiplication. Um, and and the, the trick I use is this rename out. So you take, you take these functions um, that I just implemented in, in the sort of racket module. And when you, when you provide them, when you sort of export them from the module, um, you, you give them these new names. Then when I start off with my um, rack propagator language, um, that, they, that becomes the real sort of addition and multiplication. And that's all I get. You know, the, the nice thing about making a language is I get to con control everything. I don't, get, I don't get additional stuff in there. Um, I've just sort of got full control of this, this world. Um, so now we can, define, we can define functions for, the, um, for this language. We can't yet define functions in the language. So this is what define looks like. So if I define define, that's also a syntax, a syntax rule. Um, and that just, that just simply takes the arguments, appends them, and appends them to the result of evaluating the body. Um, conditional branch is similar. Um, all I have to do is make sure that when I do the test, I, look, I actually look at the value of the test expression. Otherwise, it's just a, otherwise it's just a trace. And that's, that's where we saw this, um, we saw this language, rack propagator tray. Now we try, we try doing a computation, and of course it doesn't work because I passed it a one and a two, which aren't actually traces, they're just values. So what's, what's gone on there? Or what, what can we do about it? Um, and it turns out well, the, way, the way we solve that type of problem is we have our, we have our plus one, two, and um, Racket will insert um, these um, hooks around various points in, in, my, in my syntax for me. Um, so where, wherever there's a function application, I get this hash percent app. Wherever there's literal data, I get this hash percent datum. And now I can just 
provide a different definition of hash, hash percent app or hash percent datum. I won't provide a different definition of hash percent app, but I will of datum. And I just want the datum to make a, make a trace just containing that single item. And again, I use this rename trick, so it's the real, in my, in my sort of language, it's now the real deal. Um, okay, so that, that gives us, that gives us um, tracing, program tracing. Let's implement that, that graph algorithm. And just to recap, um, that's, the, that's what, what that looks like. So we're just, we're just going to implement this on our trace. Uh, actually, before I do that, I'll, I'll just sort of demonstrate it again, just so we... Um, so this time, we, we need a little helper library. If, um, and this gives us some, some our, our operators, partial. Oops. Call it partial F, forward, forward mode partial differentiation. And six. And of course, eight, I think that's right. There's the, there's the gradient. Um, so this is the code used to do that. Um, let's sort of walk, walk through this uh, a uh, sort of line at a time kind of thing. Um, first of all, the, the general strategy is this, is this um, fourfold. So fourfold is, is a useful function in Racket which um, lets you do kind of arbitrary folds. So I, you, you start with, um, you pass it some accumulators. Um, so in this case, I, I want to find the sum and product. And you pass it um, some things to iterate over. And then you just return the number of values corresponding to the accumulators. And then I can sort of do, do folds like that. That's quite, that's quite neat. Um, so our general strategy is going to be, um, we, start with, um, we start with by going through each term in the trace. And then we add to that trace new terms corresponding to the, the derivatives. And um, in addition, we keep track of those in a map. So we, just, we have this dictionary um, from one symbol to another, which is really the symbol, um, the, the symbol in the trace corresponds to this other symbol in the trace, which is its derivative. Um, and the, the variable with, we're differentiating with respect to, I call x, in-depth IDs is the, all the other independent variables. I compute the results. Um, these were the, the two uh, accumulators. So I, I start with my, my result, just, or I start with the trace just being the result trace. Um, I start with this dictionary that's, that's currently empty. And I walk through my, my, uh, the trace items reverse because they're, they're actually stored in, or well, trace items returns a list, but in, in reverse order. So I, I get the most recent, the, the most recent uh, evaluation first. So I, I actually want to walk it, walk it in the other order. And dprimop being the way of, of computing the um, perturbation variables from a primitive operation. So z is the expression corresponding to, to the, well, we just, we just had z. And then finally, you do, do what we said, update the trace and, and update the dictionary. Um, and d, dprimop looking, looking like this. So I just define this little helper D to just pull out a, given a symbol, I pull out the trace corresponding to that symbol, the derivative of that symbol. And then, it, then the rest is just a sort of big case statement. So first of all, I check whether it's, um, whether it's the thing I'm differentiating with respect to, and then in that case, it's one. Otherwise, it's nothing or zero. And then I match on the expression. So constants are zero or null. Um, function applications look, look a bit like that. I just pull out the sort of, um, partial derivative of my, of my primitive operation and combine it using the, using the new operators that I defined. Um, and then consists and, and lists and things we have to be a bit careful of. So the, the rule I'm really using is this, 
Um, if I differentiate to cons, what I really want to do is, is that becomes the, the cons of the derivative of the, of the functions. So that's, that's a sort of um, composition rule for, for conses. And similarly for, for car and kudder. Um, and so I, I special case those in my, in my um, I, I, yeah, in, in that case statement, just so I don't have to provide partial derivatives for them directly. I just sort of step into them. Um, how are we doing for time, actually? Yeah, okay. Eight minutes, okay. Well, I think we'll get there. Um, so reverse mode is pretty, pretty similar. Um, this time I, I, uh, I want to, I walk, I walk, the, walk the list in the, in the other direction, so the non-reverse direction. Um, I accumulate this time a, a new trace, um, the terms corresponding to the adjoints, but also because, because there might be multiple terms contributing to an adjoint through a sum, I actually put them in another, another map. And then, we, then we've got this fourfold again uh, where we compute, um, we, we first of all pull out, sorry, pull out the, um, adjoint, the term corresponding to the adjoint, which we know exists at the point when I, when I see it in this list, because I can't have used it, I can't have used that term before it's defined. Um, then we, we have to, again, being slightly careful of conses, we have to make sure we can do arithmetic on, on conses. So I, I have to just be able to add conses, um, where by that I mean at each, at each term in the tree, provided the, tree, the shapes of the trees are conforming. Um, which, like, like so. And then we, we've got this, um, very similar to the D primop, we've now got A primop, which just gets a, um, the adjoint of a, of a primitive operation. And then, and then up, provide the updated trace and adjoint. And so we do that for, you know, it, go, it goes around that in, in that fold, and, and at the end of the fold, I've got all my, um, all my adjoints computed, and then finally, a little bit of bookkeeping to just pull out the adjoints corresponding to the inputs. And this, was, this is the rule that, this is the um, uh, cons composition rule um, applied to sort of adjoint computation. So adjoints of, if I've, if I've got an update in my, um, in my original graph of a, of, a, of a car, then actually I update the car of the adjoint. And so on. And then A primop looking, looking very similar to, uh, to um, the D primop. Um, so this being, this being cons, I think I just have the cons and car ones because the other ones are so similar. Um, okay, so all the, all the code was, was there, is there on, on, on GitHub. It's just, um, there's, there's this trace based way, there's a, there's a way that involves a first bit of a static um, attempt at doing this statically. And by the way, the, the, the really nice thing about this is, we've, so far we've seen, the, we've seen this um, trace based approach, but because it's Lisp, you just apply that to, so those assignment terms look a lot like define, okay? So you just, given your list of definitions, um, if, you can, if, you, if you've got your code in that, in that straight line code form, which is just, just a list of defines, um, you can just use this exact same piece of code. Um, so you can, you can kind of already differentiate straight line code. Um, and there's a couple of other experiments with, uh, with um, dual numbers and continuations and things. But um, I, I'm, I'm hoping to work on that. So it's, it's probably not, you know, the, 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 the quality and sort of robustness is sort of slight, slightly variable. But uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think that's it. That's just like, maybe, to, maybe just to recap, we just saw a little, we, we saw how to um, uh, automatic differentiation works as an algorithm. Then we saw an implementation. I hope you agree isn't, isn't too long. And um, yeah, and that, that's, that's me. Thank <laughs> you.